Hey, what's up, everybody? Hello from Germany. Um, you guys are about to listen to the part one of Roger Murray, my big bro from Agnostic Front. I hope you guys love this one. I'm going to separate this one into a part one and two like I just did for Mike Judge. Hope you guys like that one. Uh, much love to everybody listening to this podcast. Bye. One life, one chance, gotta do it right. One life, one chance, gotta do it right. Welcome to the One Life, One Chance podcast. I'm your host, Toby Morris. I have a very, very special guest today. Uh, my good friend for almost shit, maybe 30 years now. I'm trying to figure out when I met, when I met him. We're going to find that out. But ladies and gentlemen, Roger Merritt. What up, Roger? What's going on, Toby? How are you, brother? Good, man. Welcome. <laughs> so for those who don't know about the documentary that's out right now, um, Godfather's a Hardcore. It's an amazing documentary. It was on Showtime. You can find it probably everywhere now. Um, there's so much history out there about you now. Um how do you feel about having that out right now as being like kind of an open book and letting everything out kind of, kind of finally, you know what, man, it, that, it was, it was, if it was, a, it was a little strange to me, a little weird to me. Cause you know, I've always been a very, people that know me know I'm a very quiet, um, pretty humble person. I don't really like, you know, I keep things to myself. I've always yeah. Been that kind of a character. But once, once I got through, through writing the book and stuff like that, I realized it was very therapeutic therapeutic for me you know yeah. like it was actually it felt good to get stuff out that i didn't know i was kind of hanging into in like little dark corners of and little dark areas in my mind you know what I mean? yeah so it was good to speak about it talk about it write about it, it kind of like it was a feeling of letting go like i need to do that you know yeah to move forward with my life to feel good about where i am yeah. You know, sometimes you hold so much grudges, you or, or, or it wasn't even a grudge. You're just holding stuff that's like it's negative stuff that's in the back of your mind that you're not really channeled into, but it's there. Yeah. So it feels good to kind of let it out and open up some more positive, you know, areas to, to bring good stuff to you, you know, into your good vibes. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that felt really good, and then and then the, the film was extremely interesting because. You know, somehow they ended up being complementing each other between the book and the movie. If you read the book and then you see the movie, you you see like there's very good ties, or vice versa. Of course, yeah. the film also also deals with my partner in crime, Mister Vinny Stigma. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know, uh, some things you just can't get rid of. <laughs> but anyway, um, it, the film was 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 something like it, it was. It, it actually. Honestly, Toby, it blew my mind because the whole, we didn't know. We didn't know anything about it yeah. for a long time. We knew Ian was working on it. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, we we were we we did what he asked us to do. Yeah. Me personally, like I'm coming to your house. I just want you guys to be very genuine, very honest, be yourselves. Yeah. You know, and and just just you know that's all I asked of you, and that's what we did. And yeah. then he really created this this really cool. Like it was so different. And when I saw it, I was like, man, this is awesome. Don't change anything. I love it. Yeah. It's 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 like so different than any other typical like VHS one type of documentary. Every exactly. album, every bam bam or everything. You know, it's so yeah. different and so unique that. And I kind of loved it, and it was so personal again, again like my book. You know what I mean? Yeah. So. In a way, there's a lot out there now, information, but it's okay. You know, like, hey, look, you know, no one's no one's born hardcore. No one's born cool. I wasn't born with tattoos, if you know what I mean. Exactly. You know, and I've made a lot of mistakes. Yeah. But I'll be, I'll be the first to admit, yeah, I, I fucked up. I made mistakes, you know, but hey, I learned from them. You know, like there's people that do mistakes and do things and they continue on that ruthless path. Yes. And they never they never shake out of it, you know. Yeah. I like to feel like I shook out of it. I'm like when I did my when I when I got into those hard situations, maybe yeah. not the first time, maybe yeah. the second or third, whatever. I realized, <laughs> eh, you know, it's, yeah. it wasn't about myself anymore, and I was so everything was about me at that point, and I didn't care about anything around me. Yeah. And then when I started, like when my daughter came in my life. And I saw how it was affecting her. I saw it was affecting my mom and people that actually love me. Bands that love me. Yeah. Think about all those bands that did that amazing benefit for me. These these yeah, are bands that are like posy bands, you know, bands that yeah. that aren't down with what why I went to prison, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. We played that shit. But it was they, awesome. Yeah. But they yeah, but they 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 looked through that. They mm -hmm. they they saw something different. They saw that I was genuine to them and I did something to them and they wanted to give back 
you know, so it was it, all that stuff was awakening for me, you know, to see mm-hmm. bands like Gorilla Biscuits, you know, like, yeah. you know, side by side, all these bands like, hey, I want to do this for Roger. It just was awakening. It was just like, what the fuck am I doing? There's people that love me, feel like care about me. Yeah. And, and, and what am I doing? Yeah. And that's exactly where where I was for, for a while, you know, but like I said, I learned from it, you know, you could either continue on that destructive path. And I know a lot of people that continue on that path Yeah. and they don't wake up, they don't get away from it or they chose to just stay there for whatever reason. And I chose to move forward and, and better myself, challenge myself, yeah. better myself. Yeah. That's the only way you're going to better yourself is by challenging yourself. Yeah. Or else you stay in the same rut, the same day, same old, what do you call that when everything happens? Groundhog Day. Again, Groundhog Day. So, yeah. now, you know, so here I am. I feel much better about my life. Yeah. Um, the film, I love the film. Um, I've got a lot of great feedback from it. I'm sure there's people that are, not everybody, not not everything's for everybody, you know? Yeah. I thought the, the biggest problem I had with the film, I'll be really general and be honest with you, was the title. I was like, whoa, wait a minute, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, and, and it wasn't our, we never, it wasn't our decision you know yeah that was my biggest fight but then when ian explained it to me and then when he said no no you don't understand this is what the, this is the dictionary this is what this means yeah then when i saw that i was like that's kind of cool because i'm gonna let everybody out there say what they gotta say talk yeah. what they gotta talk and then when it's presented to them the definition of what it is and then when you see the film you actually you actually even hear me say like hey you know what this we did this all together. All my friends did this. If it wasn't yeah. for all my friends going to each and every one of each of each other's shows, supporting one another, we did this together collectively. Not one person went in there and did it and, yeah. and say, "Hey, everybody, this is it." And that's what the film's about. Yeah, I love it. Know? It's it's not what you think it's going to be about either. You think it might be just like a typical documentary about music, but it's more about everything. You being a father, being a husband, and your family, and and your connections with Stigma, the guys in the band, and the sacrifices, and it's not just about the music, it's everything, because it's part of your entire life, and everything yeah. you endured as a kid, and going to jail, and coming up in the streets, and coming here coming here from Cuba, and all that, it's just, it's, it's all yeah. part of that, you know? Yeah, you know what else was, was I mean, when I saw, I, I, I was in tears, it was a roller coaster ride for me, to be honest with you, Yeah, I was, I was laughing, I was crying. I was cheering. I don't know what the hell was going on with me. But it's because <laughs> I didn't. I didn't. I never got. <clears throat> I never got to hear anything my daughter said. Oh man. Or my wife said. Yeah. Or my brother said. So like nobody was allowed to say to each other anything about our any of our interviews. So, and then yeah. what was really even more beautiful about it is I saw it first in Boston, and I came home. And I just told my wife, "Well, it's going to come out here, and, I'll, and when you see it, you know, you'll see it." And everybody got this. See it on the not, not everybody got not everybody got to see it together, you know. Yeah. I mean, I mean before. So mm. when it played in Florida, my mom came and she was an emotional like, wow, you know, it, it hit her like it hit me. Yeah. And then and my daughter was the last one to see it because it played last in San Francisco, and she was just floored. She was like, she, the first thing she said when she got up, she was, she said, Ian, thank you for making such an incredible film about my family, my life. Damn. This is great. This is something I'm going to show my kids, and this is, this is like. This is more than it's more than a, a story about a scene. This is yeah. a, a, a story of this is like a, a life a story of, of you know of uh, what do you call it? I forgot her exact word. Like of life, you know. Like yeah. it doesn't have to relate to a music scene or a band. Yeah, she lived this is it. beyond that, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. So it was cool to see everybody finally see what everybody else said. Yeah, and it was it was really it was really pretty emotional, man. It really was. Well, one thing one thing that I've always loved about you, I'm not sure you talked about it in, in the movie thing, was that you've always been like a handyman. You always had like a trade. Like when you, you did that Tent Street Squat, you did all, all the electricity in there, and also when you left the band for a while to go to Harley Davidson School, like I thought that was really cool that you always were doing other things the whole entire time you were playing music. Well, yeah. Well, I, I you know it's just. I've always felt like, you know, I love what I do. I, I really do. I love music. And still to date, I do electrical work with my buddy Mike and stuff like that. Yeah. And I can't live off of this. And you know what I mean? Yeah. And it hasn't been that kind of a luck stream for us, whatever. Mm-hmm. But I, I enjoy doing other things. I enjoy going out there and, like I said, challenging myself. Yeah. Plus, if, in order for me to go out and, and do what I love to do, I got to be able to make sure – my family is okay at home. So one has to wash the other somehow away. You know, yeah. I can't do what I was doing when I, when I first went on tour 
1985 when I toured the, the country, <laughs> yeah. I was living in my van. So who yeah. cares where I was? I yeah. got kids now. I can't do that, you know? I know. But, um, <laughs> you know, everything works out. And I think, and I've always loved trades. I believe in trades. I'm not a, I'm not a, I love reading, but I'm, you know, I, I was never a school kid. I mean, I, I never even went to high school because I, I joined Agnostic that. Front. Yeah. I, I joined Agnostic Front. That's my, that's my certificate right there. My first album, Victim of Pain. Well, you, how old, how old my, are you my, then when you left school? Oh, uh, I joined the band when I was 17. Wow. So, yeah. Wow. I, I remember my 18th birthday, I got my tattoo on oh, my chest. Shit. So, so, yeah, so you, you think about it, you know? Like, Damn. I mean, and, and the things that I've done, Toby, it's incredible. Like, I, I look at my son now who's uh, nine years old, Desi, and I and then I think about what the hell did I put Freddie through? <laughs> we, we just, I just did Freddie yesterday. We were talking about all that, how you had like, him on tour at like, nine I would years never old. Do what, I would never do <laughs> I would never do the shit I did with Freddie with my kid, you know, like now yeah. I'm a father. Hell no, we ain't going to go to no squat or, you know, with all these rats and crazy shit. Dude. But it, it, you know what? You know what was really crazy, though, about it? it was, what's funny is that I, for some reason I felt safe and I yeah. felt at home. It was kind of we were amongst each other. We were like a protective tribe. We all cared yeah. for each other. Yeah. And, I, and it was felt safe in an abandoned building. With drug dealers all around, it just felt safe. <laughs> Hard to explain. Hard to explain, right? He totally like I, I is. Can't, yeah, I wouldn't. Would I pack up my family and do it right now? No. no. But for some reason, it worked then. Yeah, but like Freddie, I mean, in a sense, like Freddie, you know, talk about you guys' home life a little bit and stuff, and like you taking Freddie away and into the city and taking him out of New Jersey and stuff and showing him that that side of the the world did a lot did a lot of great for him, I think, with the band and everything, you know, like. Exposure. Yeah, Freddie. Freddie always loved it, man. I I got this picture no one's ever seen. I'm saving it for Freddie's for whenever he puts out a book or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Of uh, of uh, him with his Liberty spikes, with my <laughs> with my ex girlfriend Kim at the time on a side of stage watching the Bad Brains. You know. Wow. So, I mean, he's six years old. It's, or was he seven? Six. He wow. was six. I mean, how? Who else could say that? You and, know what I mean? And your par your parents obviously knew that. You would take him to this world of like crazy. It probably was such crazy music I'll be, to them. I'll be, I'll be honest with you. I think my mom just felt like he was really safe with me, and I cared. I, I think yeah. the chaos, the chaos that was going back at home, mm -hmm. anything's better than what would you know what could be possibly going at home. Yeah, you know, Freddie's father was in was in, in he's a he's a he's in a good place now. Like yeah. I say, people change. People yeah. change. That's what he's he in a better place now. Yeah, people change, man. Yeah. But at that time, he was not in a good place. So, mm -hmm. and um, and I think my mom felt my brother was safe with me, yeah. you know. And it was wild to think that that, but yeah. Wow, man. Was so was it was there was there any talk about when you got arrested to get deported at that time? Or the, or the, those kind of laws weren't that crazy back then. Oh no, no. When I got arrested, I was uh, I was after I if I would have done my. My complete. I, I got a reverse on dismissal. Okay. But if I, once if I would have had it completed my term, I would have had to go to a federal prison, go through, go through the whole federal thing. Because what's what happens is, is normally if you're any 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 uh, any uh, because I wasn't a citizen citizen of the United States. Yeah. For what I got arrested for, if I was a, let's just say Haiti or Dominican Republic or, or any any just any other island, Panama, whatever. Yeah. If I would have got arrested for what I got arrested for, you do your time, they deport you, you can never come back to America. That's it. Yeah. But they can't do that to Cubans because they can't deport you back to Cuba. It's mm. illegal. Oh, shit. So, so what happens to Cubans, and this is, this is a lot of people don't know this, is they, they, go, they go through another a federal court hearing afterwards, and then it's determined whether they're going to release them to the street or they go to federal prisons for the rest of their lives. Wow. They can't send them back. It's a, it's a, you can't send them back because, you know, it's illegal because, you know, they're, they're left for freedom. Yeah. And if you send them back, you don't know what would happen. You know, it's like sending them back to the wolves. Holy so shit. a lot of people don't know that, you know? Yeah. And that was my next destiny. And in fact, and when I beat my case while I was incarcerated, it went to a second. I went to a court of appeals and an appellate division. And I was nervous the whole time. I was already out. And I was like, shit, I got to go through this all again, yeah, man. So even, even if you're out, that could happen. That's, yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, go, three other chances. Damn. Like, it, it, the one middle court reversed it. Yeah. And I got out, and then the third court finally dismissed it and sealed it. So it's just, it's like it never happened. It's that really is weird. crazy. How old but are you I then? was. Well, I was, I was already older. I was 20, 
22 when I went in. Okay. I did I did whatever time, I, but I, and I reversed it. This was already into 25, 26 while all that was going out. I was going out while I was while I was out already too. Some of Damn. it. And I was just nervous. I'm like, shit, not again. But wow. Good thing it uh, it, it it all went away, you know. Yeah. And how was that going in? Were you scared going in there? Well, you know what it is. Of course, everybody's scared. You know, you know, you you're you're you don't know what you're going into. Yeah. Um, you know, because you don't know where you're gonna go. Yeah. And it's a little bit uh more nerve wracking than anything, but being that the way I grew up and being that I grew up in the conditions I grew up, it was no different. You know, the only the only thing that was really different. I mean, look, if if you if you mess with drugs or if you mess with disrespect people. Hey, you're gonna get yourself in bad situations, you know. Yeah. But if, if you're if you're if you if you walk around and you respect others, and others will respect you back, and you don't mess around with things that you know are just gonna get into stuff because you know you shouldn't be messing with. Yeah. You'll make it. You'll make it. Yeah. You know. And then I feel so. So while I was in there is when I decided to finally go to school stuff. I got a GD. Oh wow. I got um. I got my electrical license there, and that's the whole. That's what sucks about it. Is I got my regular electrical, then I got my commercial electrical, but I can't use it. So when I came out, I tried to go to like a regular trade school, see if they will, will let me flip it, you know, because yeah. it says Department of Corrections. Well, how can I go get it? It's embarrassing. Go to a job, and here's my certificate. It's the Department of Corrections. Oh, you, wow. can you, you know, so they wanted me to do the whole thing all over, even though it was state certified. You oh, know, shit. I was, when I was released, I was working in the warden's house. Rewiring the freaking warden's house. Really? Oh, yeah. So it's like wow. it's like, man, you're gonna make me do all this all over again, and, and then I had to pay again. So I just never bothered. You yeah. Know? And uh, but it, you know, look, like I said, I, I made the best of the situation. It was a horrible situation. Yeah. But I wasn't gonna sit there and 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 just you know not care. I, I went in. I'm like, hey, I'm, I'm gonna take this chance now to learn some stuff, learn another trade. Get busy, make my days go faster. You know, yeah. I even I did I did a math thing where I was a a teacher's aide for math. You oh and, wow. And I, and I didn't you know I was in nothing crazy. I was like typical like sixth seventh grade math. But I was surprised at how many people can't even do that. Yeah, man. You know, it's 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 sad because you don't really know, uh, especially when you when you're incarcerated, you don't even know. How, there's a lot of people that are incarcerated that a they don't they can't read, they can't write. Yeah, they can't do basic math again, so it's hard for them to even function. So when it, I, I I was in a band in, in there, and and I love being in the band. I remember when my my singer in the band, uh, Oreja means big ears. Yeah, and we were in a Latin band called La Fuerza. La Fuerza Latina was a a Latin band. You know, we oh, used to do shit. all the. All, Freddie came into one of our um, festivals. We do the festivals for the prison. So because oh, we were the band, yeah, because we were the band. We could invite our family. I remember Freddie came with Amy one time, wow. and he was she was shook. He's like, "Holy shit!" Well, he's in the middle of the whole prison yard. Holy I'm in my shit. I'm in my I'm playing with my Latin prison band, you know, playing like oh. Oye Como Va, you know, shit like that, Santana shit, Damn. playing on bass, you know, and and these <laughs> big dudes. I mean, the dudes that make Arnold Schwarzenegger look like a crackhead, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and Freddie's like, "Holy shit!" I'm like, "Yo, these these are like my, there's one big dude named Coco. He was a friend of mine, you know." Yeah. But he's like, oh, fuck that dude's gigantic you know i'm like yeah that's what it you know i was kept telling him don't come in here it ain't it ain't it ain't what you think but yeah. but i watched oreja leave and a week later we were bummed out we had no singer how <laughs> oh, are we gonna shit. play shows you know yeah and a week later here comes oreja back in he was so happy to see us not happy <laughs> he was out he was happy to come back to be oh, in the band my god dude like what the fuck you know like, i'm crazy. happy to get the hell out you know there's people that go in and Is out their whole crazy? lives yeah yeah, and that, but that's yeah. what—that's all he knows, you know. He's got a place, he's got a bed, he's got food. Yeah. And unfortunately, you know, it is what it is, man. You know. Yeah. Did you go? Did you go in with a shaved head so people saw like <clears throat> your spider oh, this, when you came with you went when you went, yeah yeah they shave everybody's head. So is that First why they called they you do, Spider in there? Is that where the nickname came that's from? That's exactly where I got my nickname from. Wow. First thing they do was when they shaved your head and they they do the light shit powder shit on your head. You get the whole you you look, when you. The very first week, it's like you're in a concentration camp, man. You like, yeah. you know, unfortunately, like that, you know, shave down everything, you know, and you're ready to go. Yeah. And they give you a number, and you're only known by a number. Nobody knows your name. No one ever, ever has to know your name. I still have my, I still know my, 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 
them. I didn't number them by heart. My memory was still wow. in my mind. So, and then they, they, you get nicknames. I got Aranya, Spider, because of my spider webs. Oh, but of shit. course, there was people at the time that, that saw like shit like Geraldo Rivera and shit like that. And they'd be like, whoa. They see skins in the back of my head. They were mm. like, what, what is this, you know? Oh, but, shit. You know, I, I hung out. You know, unfortunately, here's another thing. I write about it in one voice, too. A lot of people don't know that our album, One Voice, is probably, it's, it is the only kind of, um, what do you call it, like, like theme record. That, like, you know, like you have Pink Floyd, The Wall, it's a whole yeah. theme, you yeah. know? And then you have Quadrophenia, The Who. So One Voice is exactly the same thing. It's a record about my me going in before going into prison, coming out of prison. It's a whole, like, it's a theme. You know, Damn, yeah, and yeah. in that song Force Feet, if I remember correctly, I took about three shades of green, okay. and that's that's exactly how it was. You know, everybody's green, but it's three shades, and if you know what I mean, you know what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. You have your whites, your Spanish, and your blacks. You know, yep. and I've been through a lot of the riots in there. But when you go in, you know, you you know, being out, I'm Latin, I look white, yeah, but my family is my family, and I and, and you don't. You know, but, you know, it's a tough place, bro. You know, you don't want to be involved in, you don't want no separatism. You want, you don't believe in racism or that stuff. Yeah. But it's a, it's a hardship in there, man. It's like, it's, it's no joke. It's not for everybody. No, you man. Know? And you came out and you turned your life around when you came out of there, though. Like, you never went back and, like, you just, it seems like you just got focused on music more and more, you know? Yeah. And, you know, and I learned from it. I took a lot out of it and I put it all down in that, in one voice and, yeah. And, it, it woke me up to a lot of different things, and I was just glad to be out. I remember when I got out, and I was like, it was weird getting out, but I remember that, and you know, going to my first show, I think it was Suicidal was playing. Oh shit! Lamores when I got out. You I had long there. hair too, right? Then yeah. Yeah, I had my long, and believe it or not, Toby, I didn't know anybody again. I was like, who are all these people, you know? It was a different and world. It, and it, yeah, and the shit switched really quick in that two year, you know? Yeah. And I was like. I didn't know some of these people. They knew who I was. Yeah. You know, but it was just weird, but eh, it's no big deal. And then the live you know? and then the live in live in 1991 video came out. That was when you first got out, right? The live video at CBGB's? No, the 1991 at the Ritz. Oh yeah, that came that was when I came out, right? But there was one before when I Yeah. What, that li- live that live at CBGB's record that classic AF boots and it, Yeah. That's like that's like that's that to date is probably one of the strongest selling live records in in our genre of music. Wow! And, and that record came out while I was in prison. I never even holy shit. I remember getting, did? I remember getting wow. yeah. I remember getting the cover, looking at it like, wow, this is cool. I never played it because I didn't get the record. Yeah. They sent me a cassette and I got to hear it. Yeah. It was cool that that video came out while I was in prison. Wow. You know so. It she was, was on an MTV act- too. I remember seeing the headbangers ball yeah. and shit. Yeah. But I didn't. I didn't get to like. No, get get the feeling of any of that coming out, but it all came out like while I was incarcerated. Yeah, and um, and, and and you know, it was, then the next thing that came out was was that live at CBGs, which was an awesome thing with Gorilla Biscuits. I was sick of it all. Yeah, the interviews, it was cool, man. That was a good time. Was That's when hardcore was fucking. It was something else, man. It was, it really it was. was still still really strong, still really huge, and people really still cared about each other. Not that they don't. It's just yeah. different, you know. Totally different times. So when that one voice came out, I mean, how soon did that one voice come out after you got out of jail? Like not too, not too soon after, right? Not too. Soon. I think one voice came out in '92. I want to yeah, say maybe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, I was out by the end of '90. So and then right away we 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 got we got uh, Matt Henderson. Yeah. And Talked we started writing, writing songs. Yeah. Yeah. In Staten Island, we just started. That's what he down. told me, man. He told me all about that. You guys are out there, kind of secluded, focused on the record. Yeah. But I, me- I remember in the live in '91 video, you, you played Infiltrate. That it was like instrumental. That was the one song of right. my voice that night. Yeah, it was awesome. Because because it wasn't out yet. Yeah. So it was just an instrumental. Da, 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 da. Such and a good we song, man. And yeah. then and then he told me about how on your first tour, how you got deported. And then the roadie guy sang, <laughs> yeah. and he said how crazy that was, like staying at squats every night. And this, it was just it was a totally insane tour. Yeah, I missed it all. I, I think I played uh, one or two shows, and then I got deported. 
and then because uh, I I didn't have I didn't have I didn't have an American passport. I still had a Cuban reentry permit. I didn't have a Cuban passport because I can't get a Cuban passport, Damn. and they wouldn't give me an American one because of my case was yeah still open. You know, yeah. so they, nobody would give me. I was I was like Vinny used to say. I was social garbage. Nobody wanted me. <laughs> <laughs> so well, nobody wanted to let me in their country because they were they were thinking like I could go to Germany. I could say I'm going to stay here, and yeah. I'm going to claim this nationality. Yeah. So it was it was my all my tours in the very beginning were a nightmare because I still it was that I became a U.S. citizen in 2006, I think. Holy shit! So, that long? That yeah, later? Wow. That long, man. They wouldn't let me do it for many years. Wow. It kept coming up, kept coming up, and I'm like. Oh, Man, this is this is crazy. Yeah. But I started going to Europe before that. Mm-hmm. But I kept getting I would play like countries and then all of a sudden I couldn't play one country. They'll deport me and then Jimmy Coletti will sing, someone will play drums or some the opening band will sing and then I just wait for them to play that show and I meet them in the next country, you know? Holy Stuff shit, like that. Stressful, so man. it was crazy. And then even getting the visa. Remember the Schengen visas? Maybe you never had to deal with that. Maybe no. But, it was like I needed visas for every country I had to go, which was a nightmare. Then they came out with this thing called the Schengen visa. Is when they started uniting the countries in Europe. Oh shit! So, so it made it easy because I had a I had a there was a fan in uh, in the Netherlands. And he was a huge fan. And his sister worked at the Netherlands consul. I should probably not say this. <laughs> so I would go there, and she would be, "Hey, Roger." And I, now I'm going to Europe. He goes, okay, I'll tell my brother, and boom, here's my visa, and I could go everywhere, you know? Holy shit. So I got a hookup. The, the band came in in play, you know what I mean? Sometimes yeah. you go to the airport, you're all shaking, all of a sudden there's that guy, that, that guy, oh, yo, and then all next thing you know, everybody gets in, no worries, instruments, everything, Damn. you know what I mean? Yeah. So it worked out. You know the feeling, you know, you've been yeah, there. Yeah, man, but, especially, but you were doing that in the 80s, like, I mean, early 90s, I think that was, or something, but... I think the first band to go, I mean, was Gorilla Biscuits, was the first maybe New York Harker band to go, I think, then AF, I think, right? Yeah, Gorilla Biscuits went before. So I think the yeah. Chromex went before Gorilla Biscuits, to be honest with you. I think the Chromex went there early, too. Oh, okay. I think. Yeah. I think they were there early. Uh, we I got I got all mixed up with my court case, and I, I we were supposed to go in the 80s, but... Because I got arrested in '87. Yeah. And uh, and then I, I was never allowed to leave the country, and I couldn't. Damn. So I, I kind of we were never we were set to go. We were set to be like the first or second to go out there, but I screwed that up. But it don't matter. The brisket, gorilla business went there too. Yeah, yeah. And it was it was all it was it was always even when we went it was great, you know. Yeah. So when when did you when did you realize that? This is pretty. It's like not not that obviously you always had a plan B and C because you do mechanics. You built you're you're really talented handyman, electrician, everything. But we really feel like holy shit, like people love love agnostic front. And this is actually happening, and we're touring like full time. Well, you know, um, it was always fun. It was, I mean, I always loved touring, and I was I was lucky enough to believe it or not live in in, in a van or in squats because. I had no overhead, you know what I mean? Yeah. So it was cool to go on tour because I, I, I didn't have to worry about coming back with any money and whatever I did was just enough to eat. I had nothing to pay. Damn. You know, I, even even in the buildings, like you, you've you been in my squad. Yeah, That's thank you, just, squad. We, we tapped into the electric. We tapped into the water. We had no bills, wow. you know? And if you walked into my apartment in the squad, it was wall-to-wall carpet. It was heated. <laughs> it was nice. I hooked yeah. it up. It was nicer than some regular apartments that yeah. we had, you know? You've been there. You remember. Yeah. So for people, but, uh, but for people not listening, how, how does that even happen? Like you guys went to a building and took it over and had the right to stay there. Pretty much, yeah. We, but it wasn't just like we walked in. That's it. There was always, there was always, you know, you had to deal with, with, uh, you know, all the people that were in there. Whether yeah. it was, it was whether it was a drug spot where people go in and shoot, whether it was you know a drug house or a shooting gallery, or I go in there with the dogs. And I, re- yeah. I remember, I'm, I remember Amy being pregnant, and one of the and one of the once prior to that one, I just went in with three of my dogs. They were nasty. Nobody, everybody moved away, and I, w- I needed a place with hot water. This one had hot water, and we had our place. And yeah. and she just did with the three dogs. Everything was like normal business. There was still a shooting gallery. There was still stuff, but we never felt threatened by that. It's like I tell you, I don't understand. Yeah. But it was like everybody had their own deal. Everybody respected their own deal like you know you know space. what's happening there yeah you know you know exactly what's happening there don't bring any attention there 
leave it alone. Let us do our thing. You, know? you do your thing. Yeah. It's, they're doing their thing. We're doing our thing. And, you know, is it right? I mean, so, I mean, some of that stuff is pretty, when you think back, it's pretty harsh that yeah. you saw some of this stuff, but yeah, it, that's the way it was, you know? And that's good. That squad stayed there for such a long time too. Like, yeah. And like I was saying, like the very first tours, it didn't, it didn't really matter to me where, where, where I was, yeah. you know? Then, you know, when I, even when I, when the house in Staten Island, the only reason I got the house in Staten Island, my mom got it was because I needed bail and, oh. and I, I couldn't afford bail, but it was cheaper to buy a house or less down and use Holy that shit. as bail. So, wow, that's crazy. So, you know, there's always ways to get around just to yeah. get me out. Yeah. While the while, while the court thing was happening, that was a nightmare because I never want nobody wanted to live in Staten Island. Nobody wanted, I didn't want to be there. <laughs> but it's the only place I could afford to get a house yeah. to get me out of jail in New York. Yeah. You know? I think I went there so before that, too. You had a bunch of pit bulls there too. I think I went there. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So so you know, that's what that was like. But once uh I think once we, we, we got believe it or not with Epitaph, it was great. I remember you, you turned yeah. us on to Epitaph. Yeah. You guys were on Epitaph. Yeah. You know, Roger, you gotta come. And what's funny about that is I that love that record something's gotta give. It's one of my favorite records to be honest. Yeah. I love that album, dude. Well, thank you, brother. I, I remember like you telling we sent that record to them and we never heard anything from it and Hellcat was gonna release it and then all of a sudden uh, um, oh, what's his name from Bad Religion? Um Brett. Gerwitz. Brett. Yeah, my man. Yeah, yeah, Brett was like, Hey, come on to my house, I want you to stay at my house. I just got your tape. I'm like, oh, but Tim was going to put that out. He goes, don't worry about it. Talk to Tim. I want to put it out. You, and then you were like, yeah, Roger, just do it. And I just did it. Yeah. And, and from that point on, things were things were like pretty good for us, you know? Like, yeah, it was like, man. wow. You know, like, it's pretty cool. It's it's, it's fun, you know? It's, yeah. It, a lot of the danger, danger element was gone. And mm -hmm. it was just good, man. It was just good times, you know? Yeah. And you you feel like that was like not your comeback record, but that kind of put you on the map again and a different kind of audience through Epitaph probably? or Yeah. 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 I, I, of course I do. It was, yeah. it was uh, at that time, almost every band that was on Epitaph was, was a huge success. Yeah. Almost everyone. I mean, look, I, I mean, who, they had everybody, you know? Yeah, everybody. And it was a success. Dad yeah, was a very successful label at the time, mm -hmm. and everybody everybody was benefiting off of everybody because a lot of kids were buying. At that time, it was weird. Kids were like into labels and they'd buy shit on labels. Yeah, dude. I never, the Epitaph, I never under, that records. Yeah. Yeah, I never understood that. Victory. Like, you buy something because you like it. You don't buy it just because it's, it's a label. But yeah. It was more label whores. You know what I mean? It's true. They bought anything so, on that label, which is helpful for us. Yeah. Though, yeah. It's like how people buy clothes today. Everything Louis Louis Vuitton yeah. or you know like. What? You know, maybe you might like this lucky seven thing over here. You know, <laughs> but you know what I'm saying. Yeah. So, but but it benefit all of us, and we all had a good time. And to this day, you know, everything's. We, you know, I enjoy being on the road. I really do. I enjoy seeing my guys. I don't see them yeah. till when we hook up, and, and we have a good time. We're yeah. older. We all have family. Yeah, we don't tour like we used to tour. Like we now we tour, we sit around, we talk about our kids, mm -hmm. we talk to our families. It's going to bus too, a different living. Yeah, yeah, it's different, you know. And you know, it's just uh, we're just in a different place, and, and you know, we survived some of the hardest shit and we've all been through. And mm -hmm. a lot of my friends didn't make it. Some yeah. of those that made it, I'm, I'm grateful to see them at shows, and yeah. I meet a bunch of new friends all the time, and. And that's what it's all about. You know, it's about just being good to the people who are there who are supporting you, you yeah. know, like, yeah, you know, you even get to see the same people on the way up as you do on the way down. Mm -hmm. And our, our journey with agnostic friends always been a roller coaster. It's always up and down, up and down, up yeah. and down. We ride it, we ride it mm -hmm. and we meet the same people up and down and just, we're just as nice to you at that hundred capacity club as we are at that thousand yeah, man. Club. And, and I mean, I've seen happened. you guys over there. Like even right now, you're probably the biggest you ever been is in Europe. And when I see you guys over the festivals and shit, it's amazing, man. It's, it's like it's awesome to watch you guys play over there. It's incredible, and I feel like you guys paid your dues and then some. And the thing, it's like 35 years, I think, right since since Victim in Pain, right? Yeah, was this year we're celebrating 35 years wow, of Victim in Pain. Dude. Last year was 35 years of United Blood, so. <laughs> And let me tell you Crazy. something. It's been a, it's been victim in pain for me. <laughs> yeah. Someone ought to nominate me for one of those Nobel Peace Prize for dealing with stigma. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever think in a million years that you'd be together this long? Though it's fucking crazy, man. 
No, man, I never thought, you know, like I, 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 I would never thought we'd ever leave New York City, you know? Yeah. It was weird. Yeah, I thought, I never, I never even knew there was anything past New York City. I was shocked when I found out there was New York State. <laughs> <laughs> I was so, I was so like New York. In your bubble, like, your bubble, you yeah. Mean? Yeah. Yeah. I, I didn't know. I really didn't know. Yeah. And then I started touring. I'm like, wow, this is pretty cool. There's more to it there than is. New York and New Jersey and Connecticut now. <laughs> Tri-state shit. Yeah. Like, because now none of us, yeah. none of us, there's only a few people I know that live in New York. Obviously, stigma's still there. Yeah. Um, and, you, and you know what else, too, to, to, uh, um, Toby? I kept a diary of our first tour, which is amazing. Oh, shit. Uh, okay. And uh, I'm, I'm actually in the middle of doing another book, which is a really cool book. It's more like a coffee book book. But it's based off the diary. Like, you see pages of the diary, little e- experts of the diary. Oh, and you see shit. the flyer of the show, and I talk about the show. And then you see, uh, a, like, basically about all the stuff I've collected throughout the years, basically yeah. agnostic front, you know? Yeah. So that awesome. diary is, is pretty freaking cool. When, when, when you start reading the diary, it was, a, it was like a two and a half month tour. And we, I think we only played like nine shows. <laughs> oh, it was, it was like, oh, this show's canceled again. This one's canceled again. We're staying here for a week, you know? And, but it's kind of funny when you read it, you know, like what the hell's going on? That wow. was a tour. Well, Maddie, Maddie yeah. was saying too, that people, some people would, would, would like boycott a protest back then because they thought you guys were a certain type of band that you really weren't because you're fucking Latino and people thought it was like white power shit when it wasn't like there would it was a problem yeah, back then right there was just only a couple venues you yeah. know it, it wasn't it wasn't there was really never any protest I think it was more about not protest it was like trying to people shut the shows just down. to see what it was about they wanted yeah. to show up see what show up we'd go out and sing in brown shirts or something I don't know what they were thinking yeah 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 but, yeah but it it never happened of course. And and not for nothing, you know, like bad publicity sometimes is as good as good publicity. True. Worked for the Sex Pistols, you know. Yeah, yeah. But would it work today? I don't think so. No. I mean, would the Sex Pistols be the band they are? Were then today? Hell no. They're no. overnight. They'll be done. Yeah. You know, overnight with the internet would would kill and, the and, Sex and Pistols. And back back then know? there was no internet and no. And people, yeah. And, and but uh, back then. Politically incorrect was correct. It was just different times. Yeah, shocking and shit yeah. like that. Yeah, but, but yeah, it was but, all about it was about shock. So course. people found it through your lyrics. You th- what, what do you think? What it was? You guys got that stigma about it. It was this type of band because how, how what started that? You think? Obviously, with the songs, we know the songs, but like people took it the wrong way. I guess I don't know. Well, I mean, a, I don't want to shit talk on anything or anyone because I'm 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 past all that. But yeah. I think a lot of a lot of it came from. Judging a book by its cover. Yeah, That's totally. probably the best way to put it. Yeah. You know, like, and, and but every book, every cover has, a, it tells a different story. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's like saying like every, eh, it's like saying every skinhead is a Nazi. That's ridiculous. Exactly. You, there, there's, I've seen metalheads are worse than skinheads, yeah, you know? Yeah, Yeah. And punks, the same thing. So, but it's just that it became that, it became that, it became uh, something that was going to happen, not happening really well in a certain area. They predicted it onto everybody, and it, it was a stereotype thing. Yeah. Like, oh. But yeah. the people that would meet us, and they, and they'd be like, "Hell no, that you, you guys are all you, you got to meet these guys. They're cool. They're not yeah. like what you, you know." But you know, like I said, Bad Publicity worked in our favor. Yeah. I would hate to ever deal with that shit again because it wasn't any fun. No. We were actually on the line of duty. You know, like these people talking all the shit and saying all the shit, but they didn't ever showed up to the shows. And when shit came down. It's just us and whatever whoever's there. Exactly. And it's, it was unfair. It's like you yeah. know, it's like you know, making people making people you don't want to come to the shows come to the show and then do with them. Yeah. And it's not cool. Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy even deal with that before. I can't can't imagine even that even happening before the internet. Now you can just write something about somebody and yeah. it just goes wildfire on the internet. But back then it was just word of mouth or through a yeah. magazine or something or a lyric or it's fucking crazy. You even had to deal yeah, with but, that. Yeah, but you know, yeah. Things were different back then too, you know. But hey, look, I'm glad things are what they are today. And 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 you know, it, back then it was just a different party, and today's different. But it's it's all good, you know. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And like, it was definitely a, a more scarier times, I think, too, in the scene and just different places. Oh, geez, it was pretty yeah. new too for a lot of people. It was it, the the times. It, it was different. I mean, it was. Extremely more dangerous, extremely more. I mean, going to a Violent, show, yeah. Back then, just think about it. you want to go to a show back then, you go to the A7 Club. The show didn't even start till one o'clock in the morning. Damn. Hey, you don't even hear about that. You don't even hear about that. All <laughs> these shows, you got they got to be done by 9 30, 10 so they can get picked up. Yeah, 
that didn't the shows didn't even start till 11 o'clock 12 o'clock one o'clock it was just di- different and all the wow. shows were in the worst part of town yeah and yeah you knew you were close to the club because you here it is here we're, yeah. we're definitely going the right way you know you see this you see like the punkers outside yeah it's fucking yeah and also to but, look uh, to look punk rock like you did back then people probably gave you shit all the time because it was oh, so shit, shocking yeah. man Shit, yeah, it's like when, when we played that show. Well, I wasn't in the band, but I was at that show in Camden, New Jersey, with a classic agnostic front SSD and uh, my threat show. Damn. That shit was scary. That neighborhood, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and he, I, if I remember correctly, he, he didn't got hit by a car that day. He was skateboarding or something crazy. Damn. And, and it was just like we were all cool because <laughs> everybody bought their own crews. You know, like yeah, we, it was like it was the show of of the. Of the uh, everybody, everybody respected each other. Everybody came down yeah. to support like their town. You know, all yeah. the New York people came down to support Agnostic Front. All the DC people came up to yeah. support by the threat. Boston yeah. people came down to support. It was cool. It was a good, good time. The show was incredible. Yeah, was it rivalries um, back then? Like, wasn't it like DC versus? No, New York not really. Not really. Yeah, that most of that shit came around a little bit later. later. And yeah, it was just more nonsense and. I think it's also, you know, you hear more, like everything, you know, you tell a story now and by the time 10, 10 15 years later, it went from like <laughs> a bad conversation to somebody got knocked out. You yeah, know, like, yeah, yeah. It wasn't as, it wasn't, it, there was definitely confrontational period at one point. We, we dealt with one in, in Boston for sure. Yeah. But it was done after that and yeah. that was it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I but feel... those bands were a huge influence to me. Minor Threat, SSD Control. Yeah, SSD Control was a major influence to Agnostic Front. Spring oh. it to myself, Al to Vinny. You know, yeah. like style wise, when we play Negative Approach, another major influence. Minor yeah. Threat. These are bands that, man, if it wasn't for these bands, I don't know what the hell I'd be doing. Yeah, you know. Yeah, they were the bands that that started bringing in. What I wanted to feel, what I wanted to hear, because I, mean, I mean, back then New York had a great scene. You mm-hmm. know, you still had, I mean, you had you had the stimulators. I love the stimulators. You know, you yeah. had a lot of the the blessed. There was a lot of great bands in New York City, mm-hmm. and and of course, Bad Brains came, and fucking shook everything up. Yeah, but but for some reason, once the youthier crew, kind of at that time, which was your SSD, your minor threats, yeah. you know, your faith, your voids, your, yeah. your DYS. I mean, yeah, the abuse and you see our stuff cause for alarm, you know, yeah. like we started connecting and, and like, okay, yeah, punk is awesome. It's cool, but it's not about like, fuck the world, man, kill yourself. Fuck your drugs, parents, shoot anarchy. yourself. You yeah. know? It became like, yeah, the world's fucked up. Yeah, you're right. But let's make something better of it. That's, that's, that, that's, what, it. that's what I feel differentiates punk rock from hardcore. I feel like, yeah, it was exactly. Like, anarchy in the UK, fuck your parents, all this shit. And then hardcore's like, you know what? We're going to fix the planet. And now we're going to fucking make a difference and shit. I love that. That's, that's exactly the mindset. But, you know, like, What's really weird about it is like even when Victim and Pain came out, I always thought Vic, to me, if you ask me, Victim and Pain is a punk record, you know. To yeah. me, yeah, I it, it's just the label started coming down hardcore. Mm-hmm. Like, okay, but to me, when when, <laughs> when I first heard the term hardcore, it was like it was defining what kind of punk music it was because there was punk bands, but a lot of them were doing what you called um, kind of new age, new wave stuff. So most of those classic punk bands started doing that new wave stuff. So they need a term to describe the uglier punk stuff or, or the hard stuff like what we were doing. Yeah. So it became hardcore punk. Yeah. Then all of a sudden the, the term punk gets dropped and it becomes just hardcore. And then from there on, can, you know, continues. Even even when Ian McKay came out with Straight Edge, yeah, you know, it, was, it, it basically had just three rules: don't drink, don't smoke, don't fuck. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But that that escalated quick. You Dude. Know? It went from three rules to like Jeez. twenty in like two years, you know. <laughs> it really did. But it, but but the funny thing about it was that he he was never about rules anyway. He, he wasn't. Was dude. Yeah, he wasn't. He he didn't look down on you if if that's what it you wasn't know, preachy. He, it was just a fucking song though, too. You know what I mean? Like that. Time yeah, but it, it's something he really felt and he really honestly believed. Yeah, for sure. But and so did a lot of these bands, but. Hey, look, Springer from Essence Control was fucking a drug. It was on drugs all the time, mm-hmm. you know? But it, it was just... Yeah. It wasn't supposed to be as militant as what it, stuff, things turn into. 100%. But things came back, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's for like, sure. You forget, you forget the fact that we're 
you know, the most important thing is united and strong. Exactly. It's a very small thing. And if we start dividing this very small thing into so many little categories, so many little things, we lose the integrity and the core of it. And yeah. without the core, you got no structure. It's like building a building without a fucking structure. It's yeah. going to cave in. Yeah. So you have to think about that. You have to kind of connect somehow as best as you can. Of course, the beauty of this, everybody has the right to th- their own opinions and their thoughts. Mm-hmm. And, but not everybody has to be the same. Then yeah. th- you, whatever happened to out of step, you you want to be that, you know, like exactly. black sheep. I was black out sheep. of step. I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't in with society. Yeah. I was that black sheep and I was proud to be that black sheep. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Did you like, did you like, did you like, we ever, did we ever straight edge at the time or no? Yeah, I was, you know, yeah, I, um, I was, but you know, it didn't last long. Yeah. It, I, I just, you know what I, I just, especially when I heard these bands, you know, I felt like it was a connection to the abuse. I mean, even with the abuse, I mean, I mean and I'm all a lot of these bands that they were preaching that stuff, but not every member was like that. Or yeah. Some would fall off, you know what I yeah. mean? Whatever. Yeah. But, uh, it, you know, for a minute, yeah, but then I would caught myself in bad situations. I, for example, I was with this girl and she was into doing this and mm-hmm. I was still young and dumb, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and, um, there were times where, you know, today, to, if you ask me today, I'm pretty, I'm pretty damn straight. I haven't, I don't think I've had a, anything to drink in years. Yeah. I never seen uh, you do it. Yeah. Every, yeah. Every once in a blue moon and the moon really has to be blue. I'll have a <laughs> beer. Yeah. And, and the only reason I ha- I'll have that beer is because and it's usually when I, when I go to Europe, cause I get constipated. Mm. That's the only thing that makes me shit. <laughs> I'll be honest with you, that's no matter key, what. So my wife said, "Go have a beer. Have a beer. Okay, it's gone. Done. Then I feel good for the rest of the tour." It's like a diuretic or something. Beer? I never knew that. Yeah. I don't know. It's really weird. Wow. But do I like? I don't. I'm not into any of that shit. But you know. Yeah. yeah. You never it's seen all good, like man. I, I don't. I don't judge people as long as I don't like drunks. You know, yeah. I hate when people are drunk and around me and I'm not just, I, then that's a, that's a problem for me Yeah. because it, gives, it it makes, it reacts. I get, I get flashbacks of how mm-hmm. my upbringing, I don't like mm. it, get uncomfortable. So I'd rather you be away from me yeah. because I can't trust you because when I was a kid, someone I trusted behaved like you and all of a sudden he flip and I can't deal with it right now. So you need to get away from me. Ah, I got you. That. You know what it I mean? It triggers something. Yeah. 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 Wow. So that's why you don't catch me at parties or nothing. You ain't gonna see me or no, at I've a bar. Never, You're not gonna yeah. see me. I never see. You're not gonna see me in a bar. No, I never see you being like that. Even on tour and stuff, you just chill. It's like you know, like yeah. The whole time I known you, um, do you feel like a lot of stuff that you get, like you got from punk rock? Obviously, you're still like a grown ass man, but with with responsibilities and a mortgage and children. But obviously, it's it's always gonna be a part of you, and a lot of those values I'm sure you instill in your children as a parent. You know what I mean? Like the stuff you learned. Yeah. Well. I mean, I grew up, and but in, in heart, in my heart, I'm, I'm still that punk rocker, you know. Yeah. Like I just do things a little bit differently. Like, you know, there's that story in my book where I threw a, a trash can through a McDonald's window in broad daylight in mm-hmm. 1980, was it 82, to make yeah. a statement, to make a point, you know. Yeah. You know, fuck the system, whatever. <laughs> yeah. Would I do that today? Yeah. Uh, think so you know it's like <laughs> this camera's everywhere yeah. there's no reason to if i get upset i have mm-hmm. first of all i haven't been to mcdonald's who knows how long yeah but if i get upset that i get a french fry that was burnt or something like that maybe i don't know why it would be so. <laughs> maybe i go to the locks at night hang around there throw a little glue in the in a in a toothpick and jam it in there just to give me a little harder time open the door the next morning mm-hmm. as long as i know i interrupted that a little bit i'll feel good about myself yeah yeah you know <laughs> but uh you know, yeah. I, I just got to be wiser. I don't want to be in bad situations. I want to see my kids. I want to live. I used to be, I used to think, live fast, die young. We all did. Mm-hmm. You know, we were we were living for that moment. We were living for the time. We didn't yeah. care mm-hmm. anything. We didn't care. I put myself in situations I can't believe I did. Or put my brother, Freddie, or my family, or yeah. or my friends. You know, yeah. not today, man. Today, I want to live. I want to see my grandkids. Yeah. Like, you know, you you, you have, you, like, you love Max and, yeah. and Moon and your family. And you you want to come back to that. You yeah. don't want to mess up and then ruin that, you know? No. I, was that hard for you? Was that hard for you seeing Freddie go to jail when that happened that time? And do you remember that? Or? Oh, absolutely. absolutely. And the hardest thing about that thing was I was allowed only one visit. Yeah. You know, because uh, being an ex-con, they don't let you go 
Oh, so wow. that whole time, yeah, I, I was allowed one visit, and I went, and I was only allowed because I went with the attorney. Holy shit! I so that whole time he's locked up. I can't go see him, you know, because being they won't let you. Damn. Uh, it's you know that's the way it is. Yeah. So I'm like, he's in there. He's been there nine months. He wrote to me. Of course, I hear mm-hmm. I hear what's going on, but. I live right there. I literally live in Long Island City. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, and, and I'm home. I could just go there. And That's so frustrating. It's no big deal. But I couldn't. Yeah. That really frustrated me the most. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that was, that was a crazy time, too, man. Just I went to go visit him with Craig yeah. once. It was heavy. I talked to him about it yesterday in the podcast. Just seeing, just seeing him like that. You know what I mean? Like, seeing your friends like that. It's, yeah. It's hard. You know, it is hard. I, I'll be honest with you. It's... It's hard, man. But living, you learn. You live, you learn. I feel like, and I, feel I think like... he did the same thing too. You know, I really, I'm proud of him. Me I really too, am, man. I'm, I'm super proud of my brother of where he is today, from where he was. Me you too. know, and I know. You yeah. know, you, you were, you were his sidekick for yeah, how long? Man. You know what I mean? Yeah, you guys man. were, you guys were inseparable. Yeah, man. And I saw that because I was there. Yeah, you man. Know? Yeah. And when you you see some of your best friends go through hard times, and who wants to see that? You know? I know it was it was hard, man. I was so I was so proud of him, like everything with the band and where he's at yeah. now with the band but, and but, shit. but you're more proud of the fact that he went through it, got out of it. Me too. He is who he is today. Yeah, a survivor, man, for sure. Yeah, he, he is who around. he is today. That that's a, that's a, a higher respect and pride, you know. Like, yeah, I'm proud I agree. of him for being for you know stepping up and being a, being the, doing the right thing. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Would you would you consider yourself an optimistic or pessimistic person? I, I think I'm pretty optimistic. I think. Yeah, I, I see that too. <laughs> you know, I, I feel I see that too with you guys. Yeah. You've been through a lot of shit. You know what I mean? I feel like you've been through a lot of the negative shit, and obviously your life's way better now. You know what I mean? It's like. We get yeah. To, I was telling Fred we get to do what we love. We have families we get to go and come back to. We're healthy. We play music. Yeah, we're, 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 we're our own bosses. Yeah. Exactly. We're alive. We're doing what we love, and. We're surrounded by people that, you know, that's the most important thing is surround yourself with people, good people. Yeah, man. There's a lot of people out there that want to surround themselves with you, whatever, but their intentions probably aren't I agree, the intentions man. that you would need for yourself or nah, your family. But, yep. I surround myself with people that, that mean something to me. I, I don't need 3,000 friends. Not that mm-hmm. I don't want three. I mean, I love the people that come out to my shows. Yeah, I, I never call them fans. I've always called them friends. Me too. But, but when I'm home, I'm home. I want to be surrounded by my family. People that mostly. really know you and love you. Yeah. Yeah. And yes. and I need my I need my my home time. I need to cuddle my son. Yeah. I need to read a book to him. I need to yeah. be do dumb things, sing victim and pain with my boy, or <laughs> go dance to Reagan Youth and my daughter. Whatever. I just yeah. what I need to do. You know? Yeah. Do you do you feel like for me, because I grew up without a without a dad, so I feel like I spoil my son a lot and I spend so much time with him. I feel like do you feel like you overcompensate for to giving your son obviously everything you didn't get growing up, whether it was what kind of uh, environment it yeah. was, all that. It's like I'm 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 not glad you brought it up because I felt bad you grew up without a dad. But for me, it was kind of similar, you know. It was a yeah. kind of absentee father, if anything. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I think that 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 you know, there's only two ways you get, you you get the only two things you get out of that. You can either stay in that same messed up chain yep. and continue being that same person or, you know, I want to be a good father for my kids. There's a difference between being a dad and a father. Anybody could be a dad. hundred <laughs> percent. Anybody, anybody, anybody dude. could be a dad, but being a father is different. I agree, you know? man. And that's what I want mostly because I didn't have it just like you didn't have it. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I know what it's like for my mom to, be a single mom and she played double roles and it was yeah, hard my mom too yeah nobody man. nobody wants to take take on a woman with luggage as that we were luggage yeah yeah, yeah. me too my mom had three <laughs> boys and she had no husband 100 yeah. percent correct yeah we're a, we're luggage man we're baggage, expenses yeah, we're, man. we're like baggage and yeah it's different you know it takes takes a rather unique person to pick that up and that's why you know my stepdad he, i you know I don't ultimately hate him because he tried. He just, yeah, he wasn't ready. It was just sometimes you try and it's not in your time, whatever. Mm-hmm. It's not, you yeah. know, but you know, because he had his own demons. He had, and, and and when I sit back and think about things, a lot of stuff that he threw on us was because it was thrown on him. Uh, he never broke that chain. Yeah, you know. Yeah. So I I choose to break the chain. I love that. 
I love that. You know? Yeah, me too. I feel like that too. A lot of things. I feel also, obviously, my mom never found r- true love after my dad died, which sucks. She tried getting married, and he wasn't good enough for her, for me and my brothers, and we didn't like him. He treated her like shit, and so my mom kind of she's alone now, but she lives in California next to us. But for sure, and I felt like with my brothers too, we never had a dad to teach us how to build shit or be handyman or all that shit. Not this excuse for it now, but we didn't have a father figure. We had a mom who cried a lot in front of us, so. She made, she made, she raised three emotional boys who aren't afraid to cry for sure. And we've seen her go through struggles and raising us and working three jobs and shit. So I feel like I'm, I'm super emotional having a kid. And as soon as I became a dad, everything changed. Like I couldn't watch violent shit. I just got super emotional watching stupid dad commercials. And I don't know. I definitely think I need therapy. And I definitely, I did a podcast with my mom, my brothers opened up a lot of floodgates and we talked about a lot of shit growing up. And I feel like it's been therapeutic doing the podcast, but I definitely need to speak to somebody for sure, me and my brothers someday, because we never had closure with my dad. Like he basically went to hospital yeah, and never came it, back, you know. And and you know what, man? Um, I think that's great because I I believe in therapy. I've seen a lot of my friends that they they maybe they feel they're too good for it or yeah. above it. Yeah. And I had a I had a family therapy session with about this. Mm-hmm. I, it was a surprise. Okay. You know, my mom came to New York. Oh, wow. And, and my sister, my brothers and, and, and my, and my, everybody kissed my wedding. So two days before I bought them to see my therapist and we sat down and, you know, shit came out. Mm-hmm. And, but I felt like, how am I ever going to get everybody in the same room? Yeah. And, but it was good, man. You know, like it felt good. You know, people get, people get like emotional or, you know, or, you know, you don't want to point fingers, but yeah. you have to at some point just to get other people to talk, you know? Yeah, and, totally. And, and look how many people we know that have passed from not wanting to talk, you know, yeah, or, man. Keep or, or the lack inside. of contact. Yeah, yeah he, you yeah, know, so sucks. I totally believe in therapy, man. I think, and I used to have the greatest time. I used to love talking to my therapist because, you know what? It was so funny because that I love talking to him just because it was a common person. I didn't know he wasn't never judging me. Yeah, I knew nothing and about. He didn't you, know yeah. any of my. He didn't know anything about me. So <laughs> yeah. it was awesome. It was like having a conversation with a complete stranger. Mm-hmm. And he was never going to judge me. And the greatest thing about it is that then I, he asked me to try some group therapy, and I was like, "Hey, why not? This is fun." Uh-huh. So I got into the group therapy, and I was like, "Man." These people are fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> I must be all right. That's what I realized. I'm all right. <laughs> oh shit! But whatever, man. I believe. I believe. Listen, whatever you need to better yourself in yeah. life, do it. Do yeah. it. You know. I, I, I see so some of my friends that were on a path of full-on destruction. I mean, terrors. You know, they're basically on their way to prison. Yeah. And they switched something. They joined Krishna. Whatever they did. Mm-hmm. Fantastic! It changed their life. It changed their path. It made them who they are—a better person. Yeah, and I back it all up. Yeah, you know, I back it all up. Yeah, I feel like yeah, I think it's definitely gonna be a mission. It's something I'm gonna look into this year for sure. Uh, it's it's gonna be yeah, good, good closure. I'm gonna get closure too with my dad, and I just had like a cardiogram done and my blood test. And I'm gonna go get a CT scan for my heart. I know I'm super healthy, been straight my whole life, never ate meat in 30 years, but it doesn't matter. Things could be genetic or hereditary. So I got like all these right. tests done because my dad died at 34. Um, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, so it's just people. The doctor told me it's super important to get CT scan, a CT calcium test of your heart when you're in your late forties. So, right. um, and you you're dealing with heart stuff too, so you could definitely relate. Yeah. Um, well, this year, this year I outlived my dad. He lived to fifty four. Oh wow! So, so he died young too. Holy shit! And um, so. I get you, man. I know, yeah. I know the feeling, you know. And yeah. plus, you know, the most important things you want to be around for our kids. You want to, hundred percent. You want to see who Max meets, you know. Yeah. Max ends up with, and yeah, you don't care who he technically. You don't care about nothing as long as he's, he's there's love. Who cares? Yeah, exactly. But you want to see all that, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, hundred percent. Especially when you get older, you see that when you when you become a parent, it's not trying to be morbid, but you're not not saying you see your end. You see the ending, but you, when we lived half our lives almost. I feel, and then when you have a kid and he's getting older and you're getting older and it's, I don't know, just weird. You see that time. It's like, Oh shit. Like I've already lived this long. And I don't know. It's, it's weird, man. Being a, being a parent, you know, you've been a parent for a long time. It's just, it's the best thing I've ever done. hundred percent. hundred percent. If it wasn't for Nadia, if it wasn't for Nadia, if I didn't go to prison and if it wasn't for Nadia showing up to my prison visit, yeah, I don't think I'd be here today. 
Wow. She saved my life. She doesn't even know that, that she saved Damn. my life. Just her birth and her come. More, more importantly, her visits is a really got me spinning my wheels. Like no freaking way. She would crush. Why can't you come home with me? Damn. It really changed me. Like Dude. if it wasn't for that, I, we probably wouldn't be speaking. So she is my lifesaver. You wow. Know? And she doesn't even know she did that. That's powerful. I couldn't even imagine being locked up. My son come to see me and say, when are you getting out? I couldn't imagine that pain, dude. Fuck. Yeah. Dude. That's crazy. Yeah. So how was she, how old was she when you were in there? She was a year. Oh, uh, wow. She was 18 months. She was okay. little. I, I, yeah, man, she was a little girl. Damn. Yeah, that must have been, that's, yeah. That seemed yeah, man, it's heartbreaking. Yeah. It's once, heartbreaking because, you know, you know, I knew I wanted to be a father and I and I knew I could, could I be in prison? Of course I could do it. Could I do the time? Of course I could do the time. I had no problem doing it. Mm -hmm. But my problem was watching my little girl, you know, break down and want her dad. And that's it. That's yeah. all it took. They say she's going to get her dad somehow, some way we'll make this happen. Yeah. And then you get out and then it's shit. Yeah. That must have been amazing getting out and then just moving. Yeah, just yeah, you've been through a lot. I mean, you're a survivor now. I just want to say that, like, also, like, when we first moved to New York, you, you've you been nothing but supportive to, for me as a friend. And then when my band started, like, Gnostic Front will always be in my top five of, of New York Harco bands, shit, maybe even number one. And just not not even because of me knowing you, but because of the music, everything you, everything you guys stand for, and also the respect you gave to the new bands like us and the friendship. And it went a long way. Maybe you were at my wedding and shit and took us on tours and... It means a lot to me, you know. Even though we don't live near each other, we're all connected from this music and that that world, the New York scene. It was really was a big family, you know. Thank you, brother. Appreciate that. You um, know, we love you too, man. You know that. Yeah, man. I'm just uh, I'm honored to call you my friend. I'm so happy that like that documentary, but everybody should watch it. It's incredible, and I learned a lot about you there and stuff I already knew about you, but just seeing that and just it's it's crazy because it's like without you guys, it wouldn't be H two O and a lot of bands. And I appreciate that. And you were just doing something for fun and something you loved and and now here you are 35 years later it's fucking it's crazy man it's it's awesome to see what, what everybody's up to now everybody's parents but they're still playing music and still it, it for you like what, what do you think it is for you that why your bands lasted that long and people still care and, and there's still young kids coming to your shows like your longevity it's like you were never on the radio or television none of us are like these big massive bands but especially you guys been doing it the longest and never really st never stopped like why why you know do you think I, that connection like, is man i think the i think the secret or to our success and longevity and and everything you just mentioned is the fact that we've always been genuine people and yeah. you meet us whether you're another band or just at a show or watching a show you feel really connected to 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 the band, you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. And who and, and they could make that contact that it's real. It's like, wow, this is like real, real stuff, real people. They're they're not rock stars, they're not above us. Yeah. You know, anything like that. And 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 who doesn't want to be who doesn't want to be like you know, your whole life you want to be connected to something that's real. Who would want to be connected to something that's not real or fake? Yeah, like, I agree. You know what I mean? So I think making that connection. You know, I think it's really important. And like I said, you know, like, man, you got to always treat people right, man. You yeah. Know? Along the you way, know, along your journey, up and always. down. You have respect. Yeah. And you guys always did Even that. Even when you have that bad day, you know, let me tell you something. I've had my horrible, I've been at my worst days where I'm like, I've sat around saying, what am I doing? Mm -hmm. I mean, a few years back, what are like, I got nothing. I got no pension plan. I got no retirement got, we, none plan. None of us have that shit. You know, no. and, I, and you think about it, sometimes you sit back, what are you doing? You know, what are you yeah. doing? That's why I have all these trades and all this shit. Yeah. But, but come on, at 65, you think I want to go rewire a house? You, no. you know what I mean? Yeah. Dude, and then all I get is that one kid that comes up to my show and, and he brings that record, Victim of Pain, whatever. He's like, man, if it wasn't for this record, I would have. This, you know, I don't know what would happen in my life. Yeah. This record changed my life. Yeah. I was, I was firing, you know, this record, you know, kept me alive. That's, that's been my whole mission in life. I, yeah. I don't think I was ever, I, I never want, first of all, I never wanted to be in a band to be a rock star. I never really no. liked arenas and all that stuff. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't talk down about it because it's not, no one's, 
a lot of my friends' bands have been successful 100%. and they're still doing the things they love yeah. and they're being the same people. I admire that and I respect that. Yeah. But I I think my passion, and your passion my yeah. mission has always been to somehow help others get through shit. And I never, you know, that's that's my yeah, that's my reward. You've all, you 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 have been like you've been like a, a lyrical therapist for people. You know what I mean? Like exactly. You, like, like that's what this hey, music listen, is. It connects. Like. Some 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 kid. I mean, if I take a if I take a if I take Victor McCain lyrics and throw it in one of those little bottles thrown into the ocean, flips away a hundred years from now, it slips back in. Some kid gets opens it up and reads the whole. All the lyrics are like something like Victim of Pain, they, they probably could relate to it 100 yeah. some years from now. Yeah. You know, and I think that connection is more rewarding than any value yeah. in life, you know? Like, yeah. I mean, yeah, we all would like other successes and stuff like that, but that's an incredible success. That human contact, human connection. 100%. The, it's not the, money. It's not, it's, there's no, you yeah. can't put a price it's on a it. It's a different reward. It is. It's dude. a completely different reward. And you don't, sometimes you don't feel it. Until it's at the moment, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. like there's many times that I've been part of the inner circle that you don't really. Sometimes you get caught up in this inner circle, yeah. And you you spiraling in the inner circle. You need to step out, mm-hmm. you know. And I've done that my whole life. I've I've stepped back out a minute just to observe, yeah. And then come back in with a different mentality because sometimes when you're too much in the inside, you lose you lose a little bit of sight of your intention and where you're wetting directly. So I like to step out a little bit, see what's going on, see if Check myself, basically. Yeah, I love you that too. You need to check yourself. You yeah, know? you need to check yourself. You really do, man. So, and sometimes I'll get caught up where, like, fuck, I'm on tour and like I miss my wife, my kid. I want to go home, but I'm like, dude, I'm out here playing music. I make, I'm like, I'm doing what I love. And then when I get home, it's my downtime. Obviously, I do online stuff. I, I run like little businesses here and there out of my house, but like I get to do what I love. But sometimes it's like that gift and that curse where it's like. You, we get to go on tour anytime we want. We go on tour, play music, make some money, come yeah. back, see our fam, and then you get home for a couple of days. Like fuck, I kind of miss that. I'm gonna go back out again. I you know. Love- that's what I was just, just <laughs> what I was gonna tell you. It's like no matter what, we we love both sides of it. There's yeah. There's that one. There's like one. You know, and like six months go by when you're writing a record, or whatever, and you get together back with your band, your brothers. You know what I mean? And you're like, yeah. You're so good again. Like. You need both. Like it's a balance. You know, people are like, how did you move out of New York? Okay, New York is not the same New York. It's not. I grew up in it. It's okay. I like to go visit it. I'm okay. Totally. I have my family here. But what I can't grow out of is the music and the scene that I love. Yeah. And as long as I'm traveling and I'm going to places and I'm seeing my friends worldwide and I'm doing that, I'm okay. I can live just about anywhere. That's what I just need that yeah. time to get out and reconnect with my who, yeah, who I am. Yeah, just imagine, you know? just imagine living where you're living now, or I'm living right now, and not having music anymore. I can't even imagine it. We're lucky. I can't that, do that. I, 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 can't, I, I couldn't imagine it. I would go insane, I, dude. Yeah. And as much as you, you feel know, like being on tour, you feel insane to like, fuck us. This was 23 hours leading up to playing for like an hour. You have to like find sleep, eat, rest. And like those 23 hours every day on tour sometimes can be so fucking brutal. But then when you get on stage and you connect with your best friends and then that's a great time. And then next day happens yeah. again. But then that time in between, it's like you miss home. It's hard man. Yeah. sometimes, man. Yeah, we know that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know what's really funny about that? You mentioning that is that we're kind of a little bit spoiled nowadays because we do have the internet. We do have FaceTime. We yeah, do have dude. all that. Or on a bus. Now, yeah. Now, yeah. Do yourself a favor. You know, the podcast is almost going to be over. Whatever, blah, blah, blah. When it's done, sit back. And when you're not talking to me <laughs> and put, put H2O in 1985, 86, there's no internet. Yeah. Put yourself, your family in that situation. Go Damn. on tour for three months of Europe. Fuck that. You know what I mean? And so thank I you for doing that. Home. It's because of you. I would come home <laughs> yeah. and his postcards just arriving. Damn. So there was never a connection, like the, a call, one Dutch market. Yeah. Call. Like, you, you'll spend all your tour money just trying to call home. Dude, you're Because you don't right. even get paid in like, in like money that was like, I got a, I, one time I got a million liras. What the hell was that? <laughs> I don't know. You know, I, I was a, a millionaire in Italy is what I was. Damn. You know, but it didn't mean anything anywhere else. Yeah. You know? Well, you guys, you guys paid the way for us to come over to the stores. I yeah. remember, I remember going inside the venues and using the, like the, like the office phone and running up bills and the MAD hits us an email. Hey, yeah. you guys, you ran up a phone bill in Italy or this, like we'd scam phone calls from the clubs, man. <laughs> Fuck, dude. Yeah, man. So like we're, we're you know. <laughs> We're a little bit spoiled, you know. <laughs> like I, the other day, I was on a plane and I, and I, and I was 
watching this dude have a fit because his internet wasn't working on a plane oh. on an hour and a half plane ride. I'm like, I'm looking at this guy. I'm like, really? You're on a freaking plane? <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, yeah, that, you're going to freak out over that. You're going to land in about another 20 minutes. Really? Dude. Like, we used to fly in planes. Ten, years ago, was, you wouldn't, ten yeah. years ago, you wouldn't even have a computer. No. And they used to smoke in the planes in the 80s. I used to go with my mom, yeah. dude. Yeah. You were trapped. Fuck, dude. You were trapped from first class smoke and the other smoke. You were trapped in the middle, like dying. Yeah. You felt cancer coming through you. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> it's like, true, fucking dude. hated it. Yeah. Hated it. Damn. There's no way it's safe. Yeah. Anyway, brother, I got I gotta go. I love you. I love you too. Thank you so much for your time today, Roger. I love you. I appreciate everything you've done for music and from our life and just being being be, being still being here, you know. Thank you, brother. I love you too. You know that, man. Thank you, man, for everything. And everybody check out The Godfathers of Hardcore. It's everywhere now. It's an incredible movie. I'm not gonna call it a music movie. It's just a real life shit. You gotta check it out for sure. And you can follow Roger on uh, on social media. It's just Roger Roger Merritt, right? Yeah. Roger Merritt on Instagram. Yeah. And, uh, and, and and Toby, don't forget your next tour. Yeah. No internet. No internet. <laughs> <laughs> oh fuck! All right, bro. I love <laughs> you, man. Thank you, Roger. Love you too, brother. Bye bye. Bye. Hey guys, thanks for listening. Um, please rate, review, uh, subscribe if you haven't subscribed yet to this podcast. Please do that. And whatever platform you are listening to this on, I'm glad you found me. You can rate me and review me on there also. So thank you guys sincerely for the support. I cannot wait for you guys to the next one.